the system driving the return of snow. For those dismayed by the return of winter, when we were just getting used to some warm sunshine, well, you know what to blame. The far-reaching effects of wildfire. We're seeing a shift in these ecosystems that generally pushes them outside of their normal fire regime. And 40 years in forecasting. At the time, we were using hydrogen, so it used to be caped up in a big brown coat with masts. It's Friday, the 1st of April, and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir, and this is Weathersnap, the insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Last week, spring appeared well underway with sunny skies and warm air. Fast forward to this week, and many woke to wintry scenes as snow fell across many parts of the UK. So what's going on? Surely we should be past the risk of snow? Ada McGiven explains. We've seen a marked contrast between the weather this week and last, with a 10 degree temperature difference resulting in colder than average conditions. The reason for this is a change of air mass. An air mass is defined as a body of air with relatively uniform weather conditions, such as temperature and humidity. Air masses may cover several million square kilometres and extend high up into the atmosphere. They are primarily defined by the area in which they originate. This is called the source region. In the UK, bodies of air coming from northern parts of the globe are known as polar or arctic air masses. If they travel mainly over land en route to the UK, they will also be known as continental air masses. So, Polar continental is an air mass that comes from Siberia via eastern or northeastern Europe. If the air travels over oceans or seas, on the other hand, it will be known as a maritime air mass. Polar maritime comes from the northwest, so Canada or Greenland, and travels over the North Atlantic before it arrives in the UK. This strongly modifies the air mass, adding more moisture but also warming it up from below and therefore making it much more unstable. This latest cold snap is due to an Arctic maritime air mass, which is when northerly winds bring air directly from the Arctic Ocean. With these events, cold air moving south passes over relatively warmer seas. The air starts to warm from below and moisture levels increase. This causes instability. Big shower clouds result. As the period travelling over seas is quite short, the air is still very cold and where it hits exposed coastlines, snow showers may occur. Not everywhere will see snow, however. Away from the showers, many will enjoy clear, bright skies, although temperatures will remain bitterly cold. Sound familiar? Well, these are exactly the conditions we've experienced over the past few days. So for those dismayed by the return of winter, when we were just getting used to some warm sunshine, well, you know what to blame. Arctic maritime air masses. These are more common in the winter than summer, but spring is very much a transitional season with dramatic swings in temperature possible from day to day, even from hour to hour. The sun might be gaining in strength every day, but it takes longer for the land and seas to warm up, which is why snow in April is more likely than snow in November. In fact, Arctic maritime air masses have been known to bring snow even later in spring. In 1979, northerly winds brought snow to somewhere in the UK every day between the 1st and the 6th of May, including parts of the south and southeast. A recent report by the United Nations, entitled Spreading Like Wildfire, highlighted the increased risk of wildfire as a result of climate change. One of the contributing authors was Camilla Matheson of the Met Office Hadley Centre. In a Twitter Spaces conversation with Alex Deacon earlier this week, Camilla described the impact of fires on rainforests. Tropical forests like the Amazon, they're not adapted to fire. The natural fire regime there is kind of hot and humid and generally fires are quite infrequent because there's very few natural ignitions from lightning and generally the conditions and the fuel are too wet. But we're seeing these wildfires, while they still burn in places they've always burned, they're burning hotter and longer, and they're flaring up in places like the Amazon and the dense forest there. And basically these ecosystems, we're seeing a shift in these ecosystems, 
that generally pushes them outside of their normal fire regime, the dual pressures from human land use and changes in the climate. So, for example, deforestation, that can provide more points of ignition, as well as fragmenting the forest and making it easier for fires to take hold. It also increases the vulnerability of the forest as well, because it dries out, because it's not as dense. We're already seeing in places like the Amazon, fire seasons lengthening and the number of years of drought is being amplified by climate change. Camilla Matheson. Wildfires aren't just confined to hotter parts of the globe. They occur right here in the UK and not necessarily when you might expect. Here's Met Office scientist Matthew Perry. Spring is when we get the most wildfires and the conditions we've had over the last couple of weeks have led to large fires in Scotland, Wales, Cumbria and here in Devon with the warm and dry weather and at times it's been quite windy with lots of dead vegetation around. But we also get wildfires during hot, dry summers. And some work I've done, we've derived fire weather indices from climate model outputs. We found a large projected increase in the summer frequency of very high danger levels, the sort of conditions which can make fires very difficult to control. One of the main drivers is decreasing humidity and the drying out of the soils during dry periods. That's also related to high temperatures as well, which leads to more evaporation, which all feeds into the fire weather indices. Also joining the Twitter Spaces Extreme Weather Conversation was Professor Dan Mitchell of Bristol University. Asked what we can all do to help reduce climate change and the risk of events such as wildfire, he suggested individuals take a realistic rather than an idealistic approach? I think there's a lot we can do, but I often come across people who are too extreme one way or the other. You know, we can't all do a Greta Thunberg style sailing across the Atlantic. Um, That's just not possible. And we shouldn't feel guilty if we have to fly somewhere. The way I approach it is I do what I can and I push myself out of my comfort zone. So I don't fly in the UK. I don't fly to Europe where possible. But I do fly to some places. If I fly somewhere, I try and make sure that I combine multiple trips there. So it's not just uh, nipping across the Atlantic. And then there's things like diet. You know, I'm not a vegetarian. I still eat meat. But I've made the choice that I eat a lot less meat. I eat a lot less red meat, which is a higher carbon impact. So I think making lots of individual changes, but not feeling guilty if you're not that super eco warrior that everyone seems to think you have to be is very important. Otherwise, your climate anxiety, which is a, a, a huge thing coming up, is really going to increase. So you said end on a positive, and um, I'm not going to end on a positive, but I'm going to tell you where to see a positive. And that is, as always, David Attenborough. And the way he summed up his speech at COP26, there's a really elegant way of thinking about the bad things that have happened in climate change so far doesn't mean we can't be part of this amazing, positive sort of rebirth of of the planet going forward. So I'll end there. Yeah, that's a very positive way to end, Dan. Thank you for that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That was good. Uh, Dan Mitchell talking to Alex Deacon. And if you'd like to hear more Twitter space climate conversations, search twitter.com for at Met Office. In other weather news... This March has seen more tornadoes in the US than any other March on record following last week's severe weather outbreak. It's the second year in a row that the country has endured a record number of tornadoes during this month, solidifying a trend towards more severe weather earlier in the year. Historically, tornadic peaks tend to be April to early June. And the first week in April looks set to remain unsettled across central and southeastern USA, with several bands of heavy rain and severe thunderstorm activity expected. Well, that's the US. Back here in the UK, Alex is here right now to tell us about what we can expect weather-wise for the next few days. A very different feel to the weather this weekend compared to last, but although it won't be as sunny or as warm, there will still be plenty of dry and bright weather to be had. The big difference will be the temperatures. It is going to be a chilly weekend. Temperatures last weekend well above average. 
this weekend they will be below. We're going to start with a frost on Saturday morning and there'll be showers. Those showers will be mixed with rain, sleet and in places some snow. Now on Saturday morning we're mostly looking at showery rain over South Wales, South West England with snow over the hills and moors likely here. But that should tend to peter out through the morning so the afternoon will be drier and brighter. On Saturday there's the chance still of one or two showers across parts of the east but for most it'll be a dry and a bright day and temperatures will tick up by the afternoon to eight or nine degrees across the north, maybe 10 or 11 in the south. So perhaps just a touch below average for early April. April. Again, on Saturday night, it'll turn quite cold quite quickly and there'll be a frost in many places on Sunday morning, but another dry, bright day for the vast majority. Later on, we're looking at some clouds splitting into northern Scotland with some patchy rain and perhaps into western Scotland, Northern Ireland late in the day on Sunday. We could also see a little bit of rain. Again, temperatures mostly a touch below average, but just ticking up a little bit by Sunday afternoon. We might squeak up to 12 in one or two places. And as the rain then toppled in from the northwest during Sunday night, that will bring some milder weather as we head into next week. As part of our occasional series looking at the various roles within the Met Office, this week we hear from Head of Operational Meteorology, Graham Leach. After 40 years in meteorology, Graham is now taking retirement, but here he is reflecting on a varied and at times challenging career. I joined the Met Office on the 1st of March 1982 at a small place called Esmails on the Cumbrian border. It was my first time away from home, yes. Um, quite nervous going away from home the first time, but I settled into village life quite nicely. It was army base uh, and fired out into the sea and we were testing it and using balloons, getting temperature readings and pressure readings. So every day we used to build the weather balloon and then you launched it with a parachute. At the time, we were using hydrogen, so you used to be kept up in a big brown coat with masks and flash gloves and uh, flash glasses and the like. So, yeah, quite an interesting experience. So after spending three months at S Mules, I moved on to Strike Command at High Wycombe, which was RAF Strike Command at the time. Uh, still very shy, only hadn't left home three months. Uh, and when I arrived in the, what they called Meteor House, which the hostel at the time shared by many people in the camp, for the first week I used to sit in my room eating tins of beans because I was quite shy getting into the room and the lights. But that soon changed uh, and I warmed up to the people that were in there and they warmed up to me. 82, 83, the military started civilianising the Falklands uh, and I was one of the first to go down and observe in a very different environment than I was used to. My main role there was weather observing for the aircraft. Uh, the, the winter is, is different, the wind blows all the time, a bit like the Scottish Isles where you've got constant wind and one minute you might have clear skies and be able to see for 100 miles, the wind would pick up, the snow would pick up and all of a sudden you've got 100 metres of visibility. Following my tour of the Falklands I got a real interest for weather and wanted to be a weather forecaster so I decided to do some maths and physics to allow me to go on the forecasting course. Uh, during that period, I also had to work at Prestel offices in Bracknell, putting detail onto CFAX and Teletext at the time, the days before internet, and it was the only place people could get information. So it was a 12-hour shift sitting, typing sheets of paper onto the, the TV screen, uh, which was quite a challenge for me because I wasn't a typer at the time. But I learned to touch type quite quickly. Arriving into Exeter, I felt uh, the role as a public weather service advisor team leader which gave us the opportunity to work with the emergency response community and government in providing support and guidance during severe weather events. At that time, we got the opportunity to get involved in fairly major events, and I even got the opportunity to brief a couple of prime ministers in COBRA during that period. One thing that I've learned through working for the Met Office is about taking a risk, going with the flow, uh, challenging yourself. It's a difficulty for some people, the opportunity to move doesn't always come. I had lots of opportunities and lots of jobs in the office uh, and I guess every one of them. I wouldn't say I loved every one of them, but I learnt something significant every time. So what next for me? This is my penultimate day in the Met office. Certainly my wife is telling me I'm be spending more time in the garden and chasing after our grandkids and the likes, but uh, yes, uh, you know, weather's always going to bit my heart and certainly the Met office will be. Graham Leach. If a career in meteorology has piqued your interest, you can find more information at the Met Office website. That's metoffice.gov.uk forward slash about dash us forward slash careers. Just before we go, here's Martin Bowles with last week's highs and lows. 
Here are the UK weather extremes for the week beginning the 21st of March. With high pressure in charge for much of the week, UK daytime temperatures were well above average for the time of year. The highest was 20.8 degrees Celsius at St James's Park in central London on Wednesday. Clear skies meant cold nights for many, especially on Scottish high ground. Minus 7.8 degrees was recorded at Braemar in Aberdeenshire on Monday. Much of the UK had no rain at all last week, but some did affect the Scottish islands. The maximum recorded was 4.6 mm at Lerwick in Shetland on Saturday. Not everywhere had full-on sunshine. Fog and low cloud affected some areas at times. However, RAF Kinloss in Moray had the highest daily amount. 12.1 hours was recorded here on Sunday. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir and editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.